Welcome to the A Monday Moment with Dr. Mal podcast, where each week I, Dr. Mal, share life lessons and motivation to kickstart your Monday. Whether you're starting your day or winding down, join me or me and my future guest for a burst of positivity and a fresh perspective. Let's make Mondays meaningful together. Greetings and happy Monday, everyone. I'm your host, Dr. Mallory D. McCoy, and welcome to this week's episode of A Monday Moment with Dr. Mal. As always, may this broadcast bring you what you need in the present moment. May my light exude positivity and kindness, and may my love be extended to all who could use a little extra. Ashe, let's seize the moment. Hi, y'all. Today's show is entitled what school administrators want you to know. And by now, you know, I love me a good definition and I'm team facts over feelings. So let's get into it. When I say school administrator, I am talking about anyone who's in a leadership role or oversees the operation of the school or the district. There are different levels of administrators. There are building level administrators like the assistant principal and the principal. And there are district level administrators like the assistant superintendents and and superintendents. All play an important role in the functionality of the education system. You know, teachers are generally on a 10-month contract, contrary to popular belief, but administrators are typically on a 12-month contract. Typically, administrators need an advanced degree in order to be an administrator. They also should have teaching experience, but in my personal experience, administrators that hadn't spent a lot of time in the classroom could not connect, and you could certainly see deficiencies in their understanding of the educational and socio-emotional needs of students and the teachers in the classroom. I chose to do a show today about school administrators because I just completed my doctoral degree in pre-K through 12 educational leadership. And typically the natural progression um, after someone receives this, this grandiose degree is to find an administrator job, but I certainly had no desire to do so. The doctoral program was a real eye-opener for me to the to the deficiencies of the school system as a whole. Uh, Furthermore, when I completed my administrator experience hours, it was during the pandemic, which gave me a different viewpoint of the emotional and mental challenges that administrators actually go through. I literally had to watch administrators on the job recreate their jobs. The amount of secondary stress that I felt from their experience was unreal. So it certainly was not a profession that I was like, ooh, let me go into this. And furthermore, when I was a teacher, I felt like I was muted. Like I felt like I couldn't say a lot about what was happening in the school district. And I didn't really want to go back into that box where I couldn't say anything. And the statistics don't lie. So it's no surprise that during that time, in between 2020 and 2022, one in 10 public and private school principals left their job. New research also shows that half of public school principals leave their job within three years, citing job burnout, job dissatisfaction, and salary issues. And for those who haven't actually left the job, there's a 2022 survey that shows that They've thought about leaving their jobs since their jobs have completely become more politicized. Another factor that has greatly affected the administrator role includes school safety and threat assessment, and not just for students, but also personally for administrators. There are literally members of the community physically threatening the physical safety of administrators. And it's wild to me that this is even happening because these are the people that are in charge of the very children that you're sending to school every day. So I chose to do this show about school administrators, but I chose to also focus my energy on education for the next few shows because A, we're sending our children back to school at this time. B, education 
in all facets is near and dear to my heart and see it's just simply important and it's it's more important to center the voices of the people in the system because there are so many people outside of the system of school with an opinion about the system based on their own educational experience and for people who haven't been in education for a while as a student you don't know anything about education. <laughs> I'm just going to put it out there. It's not the same. It's not the same as when you went to school or your parents went to school or your grandparents went to school. And so it's important to, like I said, center these voices that are having this experience right now. And so today actually begins a new era for a Monday moment with Dr. Mal because for this episode, I interviewed my very first guest on my very first guest podcast. I have titled uh, my guest podcast, What They Want You To Know. And my intention is to dive deep into the minds of experts, thought leaders, and fascinating individuals to uncover the one thing they truly want you to know. I also intend to unapologetically and unequivocally center the voices of people from powerful groups targeted by oppression. However, if there are other community members who can chime in on whatever I'm talking about, I will for sure ask them to be a part of the show, but I'm going to intentionally search out those voices from the powerful groups targeted by oppression. So yes, if you're asking, you're only asking one question, I am. I'm simply asking, what do you want them to know about what you do? And my first guest, he did not disappoint. We had such an amazing conversation. I actually met him just recently when I went to an event, a local event that had a superintendent's panel from the area, a teacher's panel from the area, and board of education members panel from the area. And so I can't wait for you to listen to even just a snippet of what to took place between us because I did not record our whole entire conversation, but it was a beautiful conversation for even what you hear. And then for me, I was like, oh my gosh, this is great. So to introduce Dr. Tyrone Michael Bates Jr. He's from Kansas City, Kansas by way of Chicago, Illinois. He is a proud husband to Jazzy and a father to six beautiful children. Dr. Bates is also the CEO and founder of True Empowering LLC, a consulting firm operating nationally for the past 10 years that provides tailored solutions for growing organizational culture and communication across culture lines. Dr. Bates has an extensive academic and educator background and currently serves on the advising board for the Block Brothers Liberating Our Community the Jegna Club, and the KCREI alumni. He is an active member of 24 years of his fraternity, Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, where he serves as, as advisor for an undergraduate chapter and is a member of the educational committee. Ultimately, Dr. Bates is a visionary leader dedicated to empowering individuals and organizations to reach their full potential and continues to pave the way for positive change and transformation in the realms of personal growth, organizational development, and social justice. So without further ado, here's our conference. Hi, Dr. Bates. <laughs> Dr. Mal, how you doing? Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so glad that you're here, and I'm so glad to be inviting others into my space to talk about things that are important to me. So this week's episode is called, What Do School Admins, Administrators Want You to Know? And I'm really excited to talk with you today and excited for my viewers and listeners to listen to you today simply because you have such an extensive bio. Would you like to tell us a little bit about you? Absolutely, thank you. Um, so originally from Chicago, Illinois, my mother brought my brother and I to Kansas City, Kansas, um, against our will, but it became probably the blessing that we never knew was, was coming our way. 
Um, we, I grew up in Kansas City, Kansas, went to high school, then went on to college at Northwest Missouri State University, earned a bachelor's degree in biology and chemistry, later earned a, a degree in school leadership, uh, and then finally earned my terminal degree from Mizzou in educational leadership, studying resilience and its correlation to academic achievement in urban youth. Uh, I spent time as a classroom teacher teaching high school biology and chemistry. Uh, from there, I, had, I was fortunate to move into a nonprofit academic organization that was a um, college access uh, or program that helped youth, uh, urban youth, um, get skills that they needed to be, a, be ready and qualified and certified and ready to go to college, be very attractive. That's the word I'm looking for very attractive for colleges to say, yes, we want to give you all of our money. So I spent time there and that's where I got bit by the leadership bug. Mm. Uh, it was in this space that I saw so many dynamic leaders. I saw there was opportunities for me to be put in leadership. And I started working on my terminal degree when I moved into that space. Uh, from there, I went back to the public space, the public education, uh, PK-12 space um, as a district officer. So I, I was in the human resource department. I was in the, uh, I was recruiting teachers. Uh, I was over, I was doing athletics. Uh, then finally, where I spent the most time was in the, um, as the coordinator of the alternative schools. Uh, that really pushed me to look at where I can have the greatest impact. And by serving students who've been ejected from school, Mm -hmm. uh, and I was their last hope of trying to figure out what their academic plan was going to be because these kids were long term suspended, um, maybe short term suspended, but they needed their academic progress to continue. Mm -hmm. uh, these were elementary students all the way up to high school students. And story after story was just heart wrenching. Mm -hmm. Story after story of not having a network, uh, single parents, uh, lots of trauma unresolved. Say, I said to myself, where can I go to interrupt this cycle sooner? Where can I go? Because I could see if they would have had this at the third grade, if they would have had that at kind in kindergarten, if, if if ninth grade, they would have someone would have known this and we could have provided some interventions there. So I decided to go uh, to the high school and I became an assistant principal for several years at the high school level and then on to become a high school principal. Yeah. realizing that, you know, you got four years, three, really three years in high school to really shift a student who is already five years behind. Right. right? I, and I wrote, I wrote an article that I haven't yet published yet, uh, but it's called uh, five years behind. Mm -hmm. uh, and that many students who are in urban, uh, in the urban space, many students who are, are, are um, victims of poverty, uh, or impacted by poverty, they start elementary school, which is at five years of age, mostly five years behind. Wow. They start five years behind. They, they don't know their their phonemic sounds yet. They don't know their vote, their vowels yet. They don't know their name in some cases. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're starting school typically with the awareness of many of those things like letters and letter sounds and colors right. and shapes. If you're learning it for the first time at school, you're behind. And it, really, and if by third grade you don't have it, right? Those literacy skills, you're in trouble. You're paying catch up every year. So in third grade, you are a. In fourth grade, you're still a third grader. In fifth grade, you're maybe a fourth grader. In sixth grade, you're second semester fourth grader, and it just exponentially grows the gap from there. So. A ninth grader who could not read at by third grade, they're about five years behind. Wow. So to close that gap in three, insurmountable, oftentimes impossible, unless there is a network and a culture around mm -hmm. literacy for this student and the community. If the culture is around literacy where the mechanic is talking about, hey, how what book did you read this week? Uh, the grocery store clerk is talking about, hey, 
I heard there was a competition at your school going on, or there's a competition at the local library. Did you get signed up for the number of books and the number? Of, if everybody's talking about it, then yeah, there's no place I can run to hide my illiteracy. Right, right. Wow. That's incredible. Uh, and it's something that's so important because schools are, are actually, a school is only one part of our community. Our students spend, our kids spend a lot of time, not in, just in the school, but out in the community. So the work that you are even talking about doing is incredible because it's so needed and it's so important for the development of kids. And just thinking about, because you have this article five years behind, but then we have, you know, COVID. Uh, and the pandemic as a yeah. marker, you know, and and thinking about all the loss that happened during that time and not just academic loss, but social skills and just people, just being a person. <laughs> Many people lost skills. Uh, the highest skill or the skill that I saw that um, suffered the most was social emotional skills um, because there was not a lot of support for people adult from kid to adult um and their emotions and how to navigate that while being stuck in the house or having to drastically change your routine or you know people passing away around you so i think there was some loss in a sense but i think we gained a lot also in okay. terms of academics because the the academic responsibility for our students for our children shifted back to the home which is mm -hmm. where it should be yeah right the parents are the quarterbacks and their job is to pass the ball which is their children to the appropriate receivers to help them advance the quarterback never really scores right right quarterback can score because there's some things i can teach you but mm -hmm. my job is to pass you to the right people and i think the, our families were were awakened by the work that is needed, um, the the gaps that exist in, in our students' learning. And even if they can't fill them, that's not your job. Your job is to know what the need is and figure out who to best position your child with, which is why networks are so important. We'll, we can probably get into that a little bit more, uh, which is why I decided to go into the elementary space. So I left the high school space and went into the elementary space and spent um, almost four years at the elementary level, uh, listening, learning, and found out that this is where the rubber hits the road. For real, yeah. If kids come out of elementary school unprepared uh, for secondary, there really is no catching up. No. And, and now, you know, without a good plan, without a good network, you're, you're in trouble. I think that the pandemic also created um, opportunities for um, uh, for us to lean into the, the social emotional space a little differently, because I'll tell you this, most adults in schools don't self-regulate themselves. I can teach well. I can teach you all the principles and practices of social emotional learning. We can talk about all that, but what kids are going to learn is what they see, mm -hmm. not what you tell them. That's what they're going to do. They're going to do exactly what they see you do. So if we're talking about being kind and being polite, and yet you are talking, you know, ill about your administrator, or you're talking ill about the PE teacher because they brought the kids back late, and you're just going on and on, like you're not modeling what you say uh, is important about social interaction, positive, pro social, good pro social skills. Right. So I think that being at home. Yeah, I get that kids weren't able to interact with other kids, but all they were doing were was at school in terms of social emotional learning was practicing bad habits. Facts. Those yeah. habits weren't interrupted, right, in a way that could help the students because the students were just re regurgitating and mimicking what they've seen. So mm -hmm. The, the, it, they weren't practicing, here's a skill, let's go practice good skills because I, I taught it, modeled it. It right. is, hey, you shouldn't be yelling at people. But mm -hmm. what, you just yelled at everybody across the, 
I just heard you get off the phone. Yeah, what you mean? I shouldn't be yelling at people, but right, right. not my place. I can't say anything. So I'm gonna listen here and nod. Yes, ma'am. Uh huh. Yeah, I'm gonna go to, I'm gonna go to safe seat. I'm gonna go timeout. Uh huh. I'm gonna come right back and do what I do. Exactly the same thing. That no behavioral change, anything like that. And you, you hit the nail on the head with this. Kids see what you do as opposed to what you're telling them to do. My dissertation work was on uh, social emotional learning of black girls in suburban spaces. And a lot of them that took the survey weren't able to connect the social emotional jargon to like what skill they learned. Um, and so we are teaching the curriculum, but like you said, they're looking at what you do and not what you say. So, and that's a very fundamental way of communication. Uh, as they, as the stats say, only 7% is vocal. Everything else is body language and how you interact with others. So to um, double down on that, if I could, TD Jakes tell a story about this, this dog that had a litter of puppies and mm -hmm. the puppies were fine. They were perfect. Nothing wrong with the puppies. The only thing is they walked with their front leg clutched to their chest. Aww. All of them walked just like that. And there was absolutely nothing wrong with them. The only thing is what the reason why they decided to carry their arm up against their chest when they walk, nothing wrong with their leg, mm -hmm. was because about four years prior, their mother was hit by a car, broke her front leg and carried it like this. Oh. And so that's exactly what the kids did. They did what the baby, they did what they saw mom do, right? So we do what we see, not what we know. Oof. Is, okay, so I hadn't even got to the question, what's one thing you want us to know about school admins? And you did drop that gem. It's is important for kids to see what you're doing as opposed to you just telling them what to do. But I want you to talk about what, do you remember what you wrote to me about one thing you want us to know? And it has to do with culture, eating policy for breakfast. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That um yeah yeah so uh, culture eats policy for breakfast, right? Culture and climate eats policy for breakfast. We could have the best rules and regulations, uh, policies, um, best you know uh, alignment of practices, but if our culture is one that is that breeds um, frustration, that breeds uh, poor communication resistance to trend, to change. Um, if our culture is chocked full of um, high turnover, uh, if our culture has a lot of conflicts in it, if our culture is has a bunch of inefficient processes, that is what's going to rule the space, right? And so all the policies in the world won't adjust or push back against that policy, uh, excuse me, against that culture, which is why my company exists. Mm. This is why true empowering exists. I mean, if you think about um, if you think about organizations where there have been poor communication, folks who've been resistant to change and low employee engagement, maybe high turnover, lack of vision and mission, uh, workplace conflicts, um, leaders who are certified but not qualified. If you think about those spaces, that's what our team comes and helps organizations improve. We improve those spaces where um, organizations where those types of uh, cultural practices exist. We help them bring their, their, their mission, vision, values, and strategic plan into alignment, right? Mm -hmm. We help them lift practices that they do repeatedly, right? Because you are what you repeatedly do. So if you don't repeat <laughs> practices that help build the culture, you won't ever have the culture that you espouse. You won't have the culture that you dream about. It will be just that, a dream. Mm -hmm. And um, I have to ask you my next question uh, because all my guests are going to get this question. Um, and it's the prompt. I used to think, but now I know. So what did you used to think? And now you actually know. I used to think that leadership was about me. Now I know. Now I know. Mm -hmm. Leadership is about me. And in this way, um, if I don't have a good sense of myself, who I am, what grounds me, what 
um, what my values are, what frustrates me. If I don't have my conflict or uh, childhood trauma resolved, that is going to show up vividly in my leadership, right? I cannot be a servant leader if I haven't served myself. So that is, that's critical. I, you know, I thought leadership was, I, I, you know, once thought that leadership was about me, but in the wrong sense, not in the sense of knowing my story and being able to articulate that. Mm -hmm. How can you tell your story? My wife and I was talking about this uh, a couple of days ago. Um, there was somebody she had a conversation with and they showed up um, maybe a couple of weeks after they met, they showed up uh, just completely different from how they originally started uh, to learn about each other. And yeah. I said, I said, I, I said, I wonder what would have happened if that person could have told you what you could have expected in two or three weeks from their behavior without you having to find it out on your own. Wow. Right? I, you, you, it's like a shock, shock value. Like, whoa, I didn't know this was who you are. Yeah, if I could have told you, I could have told you a couple of weeks ago if I'd have done my own work. I'd have told you when we first met. Hey, look here. I don't like loud noises. I love to see people smile. I'm a hard worker. I really appreciate the way people at, uh, compliment me because it helps build my self-esteem because I grew up with a whole. If people can talk to you about who they are and why they have, they function that way, man, then there's no, when you see me jump on a table when I taught, I used to jump on the tables and teach. Mm. My students kind of understood me, but the adults didn't because I was mm. with my students every day. So right. they knew Dr. Bates was just up there that he's passionate, right? He, he He's not he's not trying to create an unsafe environment. He's not trying to threaten or try to be top down power over us. Right. He wants to nail a point. He hopped on the table. Right, right. At that point. Well, I told them ahead of time what to expect. I didn't tell my colleagues so when the principal walks in, he sees me on the desk. He wants to talk to me after school. Hey, um, is there a reason why you jumping on the tables? Is there a reason why you you standing on, on the furniture? Because we don't want kids to do that. So I don't know why you would do that. Well, hey, let me explain to you kind of the backstory. And I definitely get your point. Um, but I don't have kids jump on tables in my classroom. So, <laughs> uh, But they know that this is who Dr. Bates is. Now, right. if they jump on, if they want to jump on something, I have to tell them, look here. I have health insurance here. I'm right. covered. I'm under workman's comp. You're not. Right. Exactly. So put yourself in that type of scenario. So, so yeah, that's what I think. Uh, I once knew, but now I know. Well, I appreciate that. And not only from the organizational culture point of view, but I think that's just as humans, when we decide to assume a leadership role in any type of relationship dynamic, whether it be in an organization, whether it be at home, whether it be, you know, in outside, when, in, in the most mundane type of situation, whenever we decide to assume the leadership position, then we must know the ins and outs of how we're going to lead so we can communicate that Absolutely. to others. And it does start with you because if I can't tell you, a good leader delegates. And if I can't tell you what I need to delegate to you, then that means that there's a deficiency in myself. Right. And I don't know what I exactly need help with. So I, when I just said that, shivers went all, all over my body because what you just said was not just for organizational culture, but it was for the soul. It was for the humans. So um, I hope that someone was able to take away some beautiful things that you've said. And um, I look forward to having more conversations with you about how we can utilize both of our ideas and smash them together and help our local community um, and how to expand that into a bigger space. So thank you so much, Dr. Thank Bates, you. for being here. And um, thank you for allowing me to interview you today. <laughs> well, thank you. I, it, it's great being the first. You know, we're always used to being the first, you know, being of a marginalized group. Uh, but I think mm -hmm. that is uh, just a par for the course. And I'm okay with that. Well, before I let you go on with your day, please tell my audience where they can find you and where they can learn more about your business. Absolutely. So 
Uh, True Empowering Consulting can be found at www.trueempowering.com. Uh, we're on all social media platforms. I say all, and then I just thought of three that we're not on, like, oh. like Snapchat. Yeah. Um, uh, we're on, uh, you can find us on uh, Instagram. You can find us on Twitter or X. Uh, you can find us on YouTube under True Empowering um, LLC. You can find us on LinkedIn under Dr. Tyrone Bates. Um, you can find us on, uh, there's one more platform, TikTok under True okay. Empowering. Okay. Uh, so we love to we love to engage in a uh, social uh, conversation. If if one um, comes up, we post a lot of content, share a lot of what we're learning, and we want to learn with people um, and do things with people and not for. Right? We we live on the mantra of with not for things that uh, I think far too often we find ourselves working for people and therefore we give up. We, it suggests that you got to give up something uh, of yourself in order to work for someone else. But when you work with them, I think that it bleeds and blends the best of both worlds. You and them, you both get to live together. So uh, that's that's key. Yes. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No and, problem. Thank you. Um, Hope you guys check him out on his social media platforms and go to his website, trueempowering.com. Well, that's all for me this week. Thank you for tuning in for a Monday moment with Dr. Mal, now proudly a part of the Live Podcast Network. You can find this show on the Live Podcast Network website and app, and you can find this podcast streaming across your favorite podcast streaming platforms. A special thanks to my guest, Dr. Bates, who was willing to share his experience on a public platform such as this. I'm super humbled he chose to spend time with me. Next week, I'm inviting educators to answer the same question. What do you want them to know about being an educator or education? You don't want to miss it. Until then, love and peace to all of you. Have the best week.